Bernie Williams, uh, one of the directors of My DNA Health, and I also head up the practitioner support program. I can see that we've got practitioners um, throughout the country actually on, on, on the webinar. So that's fantastic. Some from Europe as well. That's fantastic. So we've got, we've got more um, joining us, but I thought let's actually kick off. The webinar will last one hour. And we will have some questionnaires um, at the end. So if you could keep it to the end, that would be super. So thank you very much for joining us today. And a very good morning and a very sunny greeting from here where we're broadcasting from live in Norwich. There was so much interest in this webinar. So hopefully it will meet and hopefully exceed your expectations and answer any questions you may have. So to ask questions, if you're not familiar with the platform, um, on the left-hand column, you'll see where you can post a question to all attendees. Or if you're feeling a little shy, not, not a problem. You can actually just type in your question and then just select two presenters only. And we will try and deal with all of these questions at the end um, of the webinar. Um, if we don't get around um, due to timing, we will certainly answer all these questions in the follow-up. So it, we will be sending the recording out to you. Uh, we will also be sending out any um, relevant CPD certificates as well. Okay. So... Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two presenters this morning. We have um, My DNA Health's Dr. Eve Pierce, and also from Solgar, we have Nicola McCusker. And let me tell you a little bit about them before we start. The Dr. Eve Pierce is experienced in biochemistry and genetics, and is also a practicing clinician. Eve has over a decade of experience in genetics and medical research experience. She has a PhD in medicine and also worked in a genetics laboratory for over, I think it was over 10, 12 years as a research fellow at the University of Southampton. During this time, Eve also published a number of research papers in medical journals and also trained medical students. Eve's passion for wellness and nutrition um, led her to continue in her education and she completed an ION diploma in nutritional therapy. Eve is currently working with MyDNA Health and also for an NHS weight management program. Eve's clinical interests include genetics and epigenetics, nutrition and dietetics, nutritional biochemistry, and cancer research. So this morning, Eve will be covering the EFA pathway biochemistry and nutrigenomics involved. And I'll introduce you now to Nicola, who will be covering the available supplementation for different needs, how it works, and what benefits it offers. Nicola originally gained a degree in chemistry. Then after working as a publisher of health sciences research, she studied nutritional therapy at the College of Naturopathic Medicine. Nicola then joined the nutrition and education team at Solgar and now heads up the Solgar Practitioner Program. Um, at Solgar, Nicola performs a number of different activities, including writing and conducting interactive workshops, hosting webinars, and growing the Solgar Acad Academy Learning Hub. So we're very excited to have these two very bright and experienced presenters with us this evening, or this morning, sorry. So the agenda will be covering the bi biology of essential fatty acids and pathway biochemistry before, before moving to the E-cassanoid metabolism. Eve will also cover the important enzymes and links to disease before introducing the FADS genes and importance in nutrition. We'll also have a couple of case studies to see how this works in practice. And then Nicola will, will take over and cover the available supplementation, how it works, what benefit it offers. So I'll leave you now with Eve and enjoy the webinar, and I'll chat again during the Q&As at the end. Thank you. Over to you, Eve. Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, yes, it's a lovely sunny morning here in Southampton as well. So if I just move on, there we go. Um, there's much information in the public domain about essential fatty acids and this can lead to some confusion and some misinformation surrounding the whole issue of fats and health. And in this world of fat phobia and the constant promotion of low and non-fat foods, intentionally consuming essential fatty acids might seem a little confusing for some of your clients. So it's important that we really understand their individualized needs and um, these crucial EFAs and their metabolites so we're going to start by looking at some of the key biological points of BFAs and why they're so important for health. In the early part of the last century, dietary fat was viewed simply as a source of calories. It was interchangeable with carbohydrates and it's pretty much as far as understanding went. In 1929 and 
30, two papers were published by uh, a married couple, George and Milbert Burr, and they began to turn this notion on its head. The Burrs conducted a series of meticulous experiments which were very impressive for their day, and they looked at diets fed to rats and the effect this had on their health. Interestingly, they found that if some of the fatty acids were missing, a deficiency syndrome developed, which often led to death. Through this work, Bear and Bear identified linoleic acid and coined the phrase essential fatty acid. So that's where the term that we use all the time today has come from. And here, as you can see on the screen, um, is one of their earliest papers, which was extremely groundbreaking at the time. And it's on a subject which would go on to dominate their research careers and one that we're all very interested in today. So we know that omega-3 alpha linoleic acid, which is usually abbreviated to ALA, and omega-6 linoleic acid, it, which is also usually abbreviated to LA, are metabolically distinct. They can't be synthesized in the body, and therefore we must obtain these from diet. ALA and LA are both known as parental essential fatty acids, and they are converted into long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFAs, PUFAs are chemically characterized by the presence of two or more double bonds in their hydrocarbon uh, chain. So you can see that, that ALA has three double bonds and the ALA has two double bonds here. So we're just going to have a look at why these are so important to health. Um, the PUFAs have many crucial functions in the human body and they are recognized um, as a founding, as being a major source of energy um, and their uh, through their metabolism by undergoing beta oxidization with mitochondria. And I think that's something that's often overlooked. But in addition, PUFAs, they're also incorporated into the phospholipid bilayer. And they're in really important structural components of cell membranes, particularly those of the central nervous system. So incorporation of PUFAs enhances the membrane's fluidity, whereas saturated fatty acids, acids enhance rigidity. And it is through this that PUFAs influence the function and activity of those membrane-associated receptors and enzymes. Um, for instance, insulin sensitivity is improved due, due to PUFA incorporation in membranes, changing the number and affinity of insulin receptors of the cell surface. Also, some types of PUFAs, particularly the really long, the very long chain PUFAs, may act as ligands for transcription factors known to affect lipid metabolism. Omega-3s are known to influence nuclear receptors such as the PPAR family, which may increase fatty acid. So transcription factors are proteins within us that can travel to the nucleus, bind to a gene's promoter region and affect their expression as such. And finally, PUFAs, uh, um, particularly the omega-6, may act as messengers, either by regulating the synthesis of inflammatory mediators, such as the eicotenoids, or the synthesis of endocannabinoids. And these are known to have newer modulatory and inflammatory effects. So there's a wide-ranging effect on the whole body there through the system, from the uh, central nervous system right through to our inflammatory state. So if we begin to just look at some of the pathways, humans and animals can convert uh, linoleic acid and the alpha linoleic acid into their long chain derivatives via a series of elongation and desaturation and reactions as seen as in, in this diagram. And you can see there LA and ALA at the top, those are those two parental um, essential fatty acids there. Uh, the PUFAs are named according to the location of their first double bond in the hydrocarbon tail, with omega-3 having double bonds in the third position and omega-6 in the sixth position. And they are also classified by their number of carbon atoms and double bonds. Although four families of PUFAs have been identified, it is recognized that omega-3 and 6 are the most important, and those are the two that I will be focusing on today in this talk. So the types of PUFA available in the human body is influenced very much by the effect and effectiveness of these conversion pathways and to some extent by the dietary intake uh, of small quantities of the long chain PUFAs. 
The omega-6 precursor LA is particularly obtained from eggs, uh, poultry, cereals and vegetable oils, while the omega-3 for ALA from flaxseed and rapeseed oils, walnuts, uh, leafy, leafy green vegetables. In most Western diets, the ratio of omega-6 to 3 has been estimated to range from 10 to 1 to 18 to 1, um, which is versus the estimated ratio in a hunter-gatherer diet of 1 to 1 or 1 to 3. So this is a major change that's happened in a short time for us, and it's thought to be due to the introduction of vegetable oils, grain-fed livestock, different farming methods, and reduction of the consumption of wild meat and fish. So the major dietary sources of important PUFA metabolites also include animal products for the omega-6, arachidonic acid or AA, and fish and marine products for the omega-3, EPA and DHA, which you can see indicated here. Omega-3 and 6 PUFAs differ greatly due to some of their biological and clinical consequences. Um, on the whole, omega-6 arachidonic acid PUFA derived eicosanoids have pro-inflammatory effects, which can be quite strong, while those derived from the omega-3 PUFAs, the EPA and DHA, for instance, may have anti-inflammatory actions. Um, however, the omega-6 DGLA, G, DGLA sorry, is derived um, eicosanoid um, the eicosanoids derived from this have been recognized to have inhibitory effects on platelet aggregation and inflammation. And this has been attributed to both anti-inflammatory properties and DGLA's ability to compete with AA in the synthesis of pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. So overall, we have this anti-inflammatory state, which is opposed by the pro-inflammatory state from the AA, which can be very strong. The PUFA profile of people consuming a typical Western diet is thought to be 20% AA, 2.5% DHA, and 1% EPA. And so from this production of the inflammatory eicosanoids from AA, such as the prostaglandin series 2, the leukotriene series 4, from boxane series 4, um, have profound effects. And these are known to increase inflammation. They um, cause platelet aggregation and metastasis. And a high, di a high dietary intake is clearly a cause for concern. So, uh, endogenous conversion of LA and ALA into the longer PUFAs also affects a person's PUFA profile. And both the omega-3 and 6 pathways compete for the same set of enzymes. The elongation enzymes, which you can see here, the elongase, are responsible for the addition of two carbons to the alphatic chain. Um, and they're highlighted in red. They're mainly located on the endoplasmic reticulum. And these enzymes are generally thought to be highly available and efficient. However, the desaturase enzymes are microsomal enzymes, and they're key enzymes in PUFA metabolism, of which delta-5 and delta-6 are key. Um, the conversion of delta-6 desaturase, or D6D, of ALA to SDA, and then also LA to GL, GLA, is thought to be the rate-limiting step for both pathways, with um, D5D also being subject to rate limitations. The functioning of these key enzymes, therefore, has profound effects on our PUFA profile, and this affects our production of the inflammatory mediators, whether the pro or the anti. Um, these desaturated, uh, desaturation reactions are recognized, um, and this was from the 1970s, as the rate-limiting step in fatty acid metabolism. But I think, paradoxically, from an inflammation perspective, AA, in addition to high dietary intake previously discussed, can also be synthesized from DGLA by the um, desaturized enzymes, leading to increased pro-inflammatory mediators. So importantly, these products can also regulate transcription and a wide range of cellular activities via cellular and nuclear receptors, such as the NF-kappa B and the PPAR, which I mentioned previously. These transcription factors modulate the expression of numerous genes, and they may impact immune response. Um, therefore, dietary supplementation with GLA has the capacity to both increase levels of anti-inflammatory DGLA and AA, whose metabolic products promote inflammation. 
The relative activity of the desaturase enzymes is also affected by the availability of relevant cofactors, some of which I've indicated on the screen here. Um, so we can see magnesium, zinc, B6, B3, vitamin C, um, biotin. Um, also, there are others known such as calcium, um, and I've put them on here. So obviously, these would affect the, um, the conversion pathway as well. But if we just move on to look at the fatty acid desaturase genes, those responsible for the production of D6D and D5D, um, research, um, recent studies have suggested that the efficiency of several steps in these pathways, in particular the desaturase steps, has, uh, is highly impacted by genetic variations. D5D and D6D are encoded by FADS1 and FADS2 genes, which are located on chromosome 11, and they are known to be part of what is known as the FADS cluster. And research uh, studies of genetic variants in these genes has been associated with changes in serum PUFA profiles showing a functional effect on desaturase activity, and from that, a functional effect on inflammatory state. So just to recap, because there was a lot of information there, the P4 levels are in influenced both by diet and genetic inheritability, uh, with the D5D and D6D desaturized enzymes being strongly associated with your PUFA profile and inflammatory state. The D5D and D6D are encoded by the FADS1 and FADS2 genes, respectively. And research has shown that genetic variants within these genes strongly influences PUFA and decosinoid profiles. So that's uh, then moving on to inflammatory state. Desaturase activity has been associated with different disease phenotypes. So we'll just have a look at that. Experiments in this area look at a product to precursor ratios of PUFAs to establish a profile. So for instance, LA to AA as a ratio or ALA to EPA. Using this framework analysis of these, um, the analysis of the desaturase activity has found a relationship to inflammation and diseases modulated by this. And this is how um, the research establishment look at um, the pathways. They check the ratios between these uh, essential fatty acids and then make correlations from that. <clears throat> so I've just indicated here some of the diseases likely um, linked to desaturase activity using this method. And this includes insulin resistance with a high DC, D6D, low D5D activity. And overall, that gives a high DC, desaturase activity. The obesity with a high D6D again and a low D5D activity. Hypertension, a general high desaturase activity. Cardiovascular disease, we have again the high D6D and a low D5D activity. Uh, forms of the non-alcohol fatty liver disease, again high D6D, low D5D, and uh, some links beginning to be seen to cancer with um, high D6D activity in particular. So here is um, some research with which uh, follows on from these research studies of the um, ratios and the desaturase activities. And this is looking at uh, genetic variants within the FADS1 and 2 genes. And these show strong association, again, with the PUFA levels. And, do, and this has been uh, shown to be due to desaturase activity and therefore links to human inflammatory diseases. So overall, a one-size-fits-all model of supplementation of PUFAs and dietary guidelines may, be, may not be appropriate for, and we're beginning to see that there's specific nuances that are important, and again, that we should be looking at our clients on an individual basis. And I think that's something as NTs that we can all very much relate to. So here's a summary slide for you of the FAD SNPs. So these are the genetic variants, those so single nucleotide polymorphism changes that are in the FADS genes. So we'll start with um, FADS1. And this has been associated with a reduced D5D activity. 
Research has shown that reduced D5D activity is related to the inflammatory states, such as obesity and insulin resistance, which I've already shown you. And from a nutritional perspective, we can start to consider the impact this would have on downstream production of omega-3. So in this case, dietary sources of ALA may not be converted and supplementation with EPA and DHA could be considered. And um, research has established this as beneficial and it is continuing to be um, done at the moment and ongoing. So here we have the FADS2. So this is a FADS2 SNP that is found in the gene promoter region. Uh, that um, has been associated with increased D6D activity and it allows the binding of a ELK1 transcription factor. So increased D6D activity is being correlated again to those inflammatory states such as obesity, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And from a nutritional perspective, we can consider the impact this would have on downstream production of omega-6 and its eicosanoids. In this case, the dietary sources of LA may be increasingly converted to AA as there is a preference for this omega-6 pathway in this case. Um, reduction in omega-6 dietary sources and supplementation with EPA and DHA, both as an anti-inflammatory response and slowing of that DGLA to AA conversion could be considered. Um, and again, research has shown this as, as being beneficial in these um, in this particular SNP, and the research is ongoing. So aside from the um, genetic variations, um, we would always recommend using functional testing to give you some more information related to these genetic variants. And in this instance, it would be a fatty acid profile indicating levels of your PUFAs and metabolites. And but particularly an omega-3 index would be useful or and, or and a ratio to omega-6. So the omega-3 index is a measure of omega-3 fatty acids, the EPA and DHA in red blood cells. Um, and this was related to cardiovascular uh, risk by a Dr. William Harris. And it is a percentage of the total amount of fatty acids present. So, at my DNA Health, we are very excited to be introducing these two new genetic variants into our panel. And so here's a summary slide for you where we can just have a look at what we are including. The panel includes um, a look at the epigenetic side. So you quest there's a questionnaire for your patients or clients. Um, it has a 27 possible outcomes and this will assess yeah, their um, diet and lifestyle and their pathway function for you. Um, the FADS1 and 2 genetic variants are both there, uh, so you can see them indicated and there will be a result. And then from that, you will have specific personalised recommendations for your clients uh, and information also in your practitioner portal um, if you needed some help with what to do with the recommendations. So if we just have a look at the EFA questionnaire, um, your client or yourself can do the questionnaire and it will give you a range of their EFA likelihood or issues. So you have healthy A range would be between 0 and 4, moderate 5 to 9, and then healthy 10 to 15. And that's all within the practitioner portal on the MyDNA Health um, website. So some of the questions that are on there, for instance, we have, are you following a low fat diet through to issues of skin, um, responses to aspirin and ibuprofen, uh, moving on to muscle fatigue and issues with sleeping, um, suffer from allergies and poor night, poor night vision. So when would you consider the EFA pathway DNA test for your client? I think this is something that we should look at. So understanding the genetic potential for your essential fatty acid metabolism is very useful uh, for client concerns. And these particularly include chronic pain and inflammatory conditions. Those with a heightened cardiovascular risk, so maybe antecedents or mediators there. A weight insulin resistance issue um, or uh, going back to the central nervous system, slow, uh, low mood and depression. So I've got two case studies that I just want to quickly look at to try and put these into practice to make it more real as such. Um, so this is the case study of Rosie. 
she has an at the top here you can see we have an overall result of impaired EFA pathway. Um, the results are split down here, so her questionnaire results put her in the healthy range. So she was between 0 and 4 scores there. So obviously she's managing her epigenetics nicely, her lifestyle and diet. Um, her FADS1 and FADS2 genotypes are, the FADS1 is wild type, uh, which would, would indicate a healthy functioning D5D enzyme, no issues with fat SNP. But the FADS2 is a heterozygous genetic variant, which means she has one copy of the wild type and one copy of the um, genetic variant. And this may indicate increased D6D enzyme activity, um, as we discussed, possibly leading to that heightened inflammatory state. So the nutrition and lifestyle modifications that would come from that would be to reduce her omega-6 intake, uh, looking at her diet a little bit more closely, increase her omega-3 possibly, you could either do that through diet or specifically with supplements, um, ensure adequate indicate, uh, intake of the cofactors if you're going for the diet, um, uh, through the pathway, through the D5D, um, reduce or remove inhibitors such as stress toxins, um, alcohol and smoking and a high sugar diet. And here we can see to the right there are some of the other questionnaires that are available on the My DNA Health Pathway portal so you could get your client to retake these and look at these specifically. So here Rosie has some issues maybe with toxicity, you could look at that and sugar metabolism as we know there's a very link to um, inflammatory states and the FADS1, FADS2 gene function. So uh, Rosie also has some functional testing uh, for us. So her omega-3 index is 8.7, which is in the optimal range. So that's excellent. That ties in with her healthy questionnaire there. But her AA to EPA ratio is showing her just between the optimal and acceptable range, which may indicate that increased FADS um, activity there, the D6D activity. So it may be uh, some of the recommendations that we said about reducing down omega-6 would be very useful here and possibly boosting her um, essential fatty acid, the EPA and DPA, up a little bit more to help her overall ratio. We just move on to Susan, our second case study. Um, her overall result is an impaired EFA pathway. Her questionnaire is showing her as moderate, so she has some areas that may need some work or could be looked at as potentials. Uh, if we look at her genotype here, her FADS1, she is showing a homozygous genetic variant, so she has two copies of the genetic variants there, which would indicate um, reduced D5D enzyme activity, so that was that omega-3 side. And then we have the FADS2, she's actually wild type for this one, so she has no genetic variants in her FADS2 for this particular SNP, which would indicate a normal functioning D6D enzyme. So her nutrition and lifestyle modifications, we could reduce her omega-6 and increase omega-3 again to change that ratio around, ensure adequate intake of the cofactors, uh, again looking at stresses, um, considering her for some EPA and DHA supplementation, she may not have the genetic capability of converting um, through the pathway, so we may need to put in a supplement there or with diet, uh, oily fish for example, and consider requesting a fatty acid functional testing, so if we have a look at that, again here on the right we have um, some of her questionnaire results which could give an indication of other areas linked to this which could be looked at. So for Susan, her omega-3 index is in the un, uh, undesirable range, which would indicate that she is not um, consuming enough uh, EPA or DHA. And again, that ties in with her um, SNP, which shows that she has a reduced ability to convert her pathway. And her, again, her AA and EPA ratio is in the suboptimal range, which, which is uh, similar to the previous slide. So that shows that again her ratio to the omega-6 is out and would need to be looked at. So the advice to reduce down her omega-6, increase omega-3 and support that around those other questionnaires that we looked at and all her other um, mediators and antecedents would be very useful.
So I'm just going to pass over to Nicola. Um, I'm going to mute myself and she's going to speak about some supplementation. Thanks very much, Eve. I was really enjoying listening to you talking there. And, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's Nicola here. Um, so I'm just going to talk through just uh, a couple of the, the, the range that, that we have here at Solgar. We do have rather a large range of, of fatty acids, of, of, um, of oils. Um, but the, the one that you can see here, uh, this is a full spectrum Omega Wild Alaskan Salmon Oil. Um, and these have been manufactured from wild Alaskan salmon that's been sustainably caught from the, the waters off the coast of, of Alaska. And, and these are in a natural triglyceride form, which I will be talking about just in a, in a moment. So the, the type of salmon that we use for, for this uh, supplement is sockeye salmon, uh, which lives in the northern Pacific Ocean, um, but actually breeds in, in fresh water. And uh, these salmon return to the freshwater systems of the birth in the months of June and July, uh, where they're guided home by the, by the odour of, of that parent stream. Um, where they were born. So you might even, and I certainly remember seeing wildlife documentaries um, as, as a child where the birds are, are standing in water trying to catch these fish and that's the, the sockeye salmon. So sockeye salmon is a superior species of salmon um, and it's not allowed to be farmed and it's, it's really identifiable by its bright red flesh um, as opposed to a pink colour of other salmon. And this is due to really high levels of astaxanthin um, which is an antioxidant that, that's present in, in salmon and in flamingos, gives them their vibrant colour as well. And, and this red colour is obtained um, from eating krill and plankton while they're in the ocean. So just wanted to show you just a, a very quick comparison between wild and farm salmon. Um, as I've just mentioned, so in the wild they have a natural diet of algae. Um, and plankton, but in, in farm salmon, they, they have, you know, corn, cereal, additives, um, antibiotics at times as well. Um, with, with the wild, they are naturally low in arachidonic acid, uh, whereas in farmed, they're, they're much higher. Um, and again, reflecting on the, the, the ratio with the, the omega-3, that is much higher in the, in the wild salmon than you would find in the, in the farmed. And the levels of astaxanthin are are much, much higher in farmed as opposed to, um, and wild as opposed to farmed. And um, I have been told that in a in, in number of, of um, farm fisheries, uh, that there's actually a colour code to choose from. And the manufacturers can, can choose which colour salmon they want to, to give to the farmed fish, uh, which is not entirely appetising. Um, but, but hopefully that just gives, gives a snapshot of, of some of the main differences between wild and farmed. And this this table here actually shows you what you would find um, on the label of, of the wild Alaskan salmon. So uh, this, this is the whole range of omegas that you get in, in this product. It's not just limited just to omega-3 and omega-6, but as you can see, there's all, also omega-7 and omega-9. Um, so with omega-7, um, you know, this is a really essential fatty acid for epithelial cells and, and mucous membranes. Um, so this could be good for conditions such as eczema and acne and, and ulcers in, in the digestive tract. Um, and with omega-9, this is a monosaturated, monosaturated fatty acid. Um, and this could be really supportive against high blood pressure, um, high levels of LDL cholesterol and mental decline. So this, this range of fatty acids that you can see here, um, this reflects the proportions um, that would be found actually in the wild salmon itself. So it's as close as you can get to the wild salmon breakdown as, as possible. Um, just worth mentioning that we also do add vitamin D3 uh, to this product and also astaxanthin that really helps with maintaining the stability of the product, which is really important for any fish oil. Now, our wild Alaskan uh, fish oil goes through a coal filtration purification process, and this is to remove impurities such as heavy metals and dioxins and PCBs, um, but while still maintaining the, the, the integrity of the oil and the potency as well. 
Um, so the process that we use um, is, is compliant with the, the global organization for EPA and DHA Omega-3, GOED for short, a bit easier to say. Um, and GOED have produced a monograph um, which specifies how the, the manufacturer of, of officials, how they set the standards for, for quality and, and for purity. Um, and so we're a voluntary member of, of GOED and we, we would adhere to that monograph to ensure that, that the standards are as high as they can be. Um, GOED itself is an association of supporters and, and manufacturers of PPA and DHA fatty acids. And they're working to, to educate consumers and work with governments, the healthcare community, um, about setting high ethical and quality standards for, for fish oils. We also support here at Solgar the Wild Salmon Centre. And this is an organization dedicated to helping protect wild salmon and their natural habitats along the Pacific Rim. So this organization is really good at helping fisheries to achieve sustainability, ongoing sustainability, um, as well as minimizing the, the impact that they may have on the environment around them. So this and now here the Omica three triple strength that you can see. Um, this is another product in our range of fish oils and it's almost at the other end of, of the range from our full spectrum, um, <clears throat> uh, a wild Alaskan summer full spectrum. So the, the dosage of EPA and, and DHA is, is much higher than you would find in our wild Alaskan salmon oil. So as you can see here, for example, we've got just over a thousand uh, milligrams in, in a daily dose that we recommend for, um, for, for EPA, whereas in the wild Alaskan, that's more like 200 milligrams. So whichever you would recommend depends on the needs of your client. Um, so the, the, the concentration of the, the omega-3 in, in this fish oil, in the, in the triple strength, has been increased through a process called ethylation. And that's something that I'll be looking at very shortly with you. So, as I briefly mentioned before, fish oils can be really susceptible to, to oxidation. Um, and this, this rate of oxidation is influenced by a number of factors, including exposure to oxygen and light, the temperature, the antioxidant content, um, and the presence of, of heavy metals. So, Solgar really does everything that we can to ensure oxidation is minimized. Um, and so, for example, in this formula, we've included mixed tocopherols or vitamin E um, to ensure stability uh, as, a, as a really good antioxidant. Uh, the purification process that this fish oil goes through eliminates PCBs, and mercury and other heavy metals. Um, and also we, we package this and all, all of our fish oils in, in amber glass bottles. So that really does um, prevent the damage from, from light from affecting the fish itself, fish oils. Now, this is just a slide. This and the next slide is just something that it's actually a bit of a, a mini recap of what Eve had mentioned earlier, but um, it's it's just worth mentioning again. Um, just I'll, I'll just mention a very simple, simple way um, that although omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are generally referred to as essential, um, only the linoleic and alpha linolenic acid, which are at the very top of the two pathways, uh, are truly essential. So once we have either of these, these fats um, ingested, then our body has got enzymes that can convert these fatty acids into other molecules that the body will then use. So as Eve mentioned, both omega-3 and omega-6 pathways use the same enzymes, which are called delta-6 desaturase, and delta-5 desaturase. So we can see here uh, delta-6 and delta-5 converting the ALA to EPA. And then if I flip to the next one, we can see that the delta-6 converts the linoleic acid to GLA, gamma-linolenic acid. Don't know why that's not called gamma-linoleic acid. I've always thought that would make more sense, but there must be a good reason for it. Um, and then further down the pathway, we can see that the delta-5 desaturase is involved in converting the GGLA to arachidonic acid. If I go back to the omega-3, um, 
So the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids have to, have got to compete with these enzymes to produce their final products. So studies have shown that the enzymes used in these pathways uh, prefer the omega-3 pathway. And it turns out that in diets that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, most of the enzymes will be busy converting the omega-3 fatty acids. In the omega-6 fatty acid pathway, which you can see here, DGLA can, can be converted to either the anti-inflammatory prostaglandin 1, which you can see on the right-hand side, or into arachidonic acid, which is a precursor of prostaglandin 2. And, and that is, is, is obviously pro-inflammatory. So conversion of DGLA into prostaglandin 1 doesn't need any enzymes, but conversion of DGLA into arachidonic acid does require the delta-5 desaturized enzyme, as you can see. So diets which are high in omega-3, most of this delta-5 desaturase will be used in that omega-3 pathway. So very few of the delta-5 desaturase enzymes will be available to convert DGLA into rachidonic acid, and then subsequently the pro-inflammatory PG2. So DGLA ends up being converted into the anti-inflammatory prostaglandin 1 and inflammation is, in, is decreased. But if a diet is low in omega-3 fatty acids, then large quantities of delta-5 desaturase are available to convert DGLA into arachidonic acid, which is then converted into the inflammatory prostaglandin 2. So generally, the more omega-3 fatty acids in our body, then the fewer enzymes are available to convert omega-6 fatty acids into inflammatory prostaglandins. And, and so obviously, depending on, on your genetic profile, it, it's the optimum balance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids that is essential for proper health. Um, but as already mentioned by, by Eve in, in, um, in, in wonderful um, amount of, of depth, then uh, the, the typical Western diet is, is typically high in omega-6 and, and low in omega-3. So, as I mentioned previously, the, the wild Alaskan salmon oil is, is in the triglyceride form and the, the triple strength omega-3 is in an ethyl ester form. So, these next couple of slides will just explain the difference between the two. So, this here, as you can see, is the structure of triglyceride and, and fats in most food sources are found in this form. They're comprised of three fatty acids, which you can see um, sticking out here, linked to the glycerol backbone on the left-hand side. And without glycerol, these three fatty acids would be vulnerable to oxidation and breakdown. So this presence of glycerol really does provide stability, as do the antioxidants such as astaxanthin and vitamin E. The number of possible combinations um, of fatty acids and triglycerides is, is large, but today we're just focusing mainly on EPA and DHA fatty acids. Now, digestion in general of fats requires them to be broken down uh, in, from larger molecules into, into smaller ones. And triglycerides by themselves are too big to, to travel across the cell membrane to get into the intestinal cells. So bile and the enzyme lipase in the digestive tract help to emulsify the triglycerides, breaking them down into two free fatty acids plus one monoglyceride which is a glycerol attached to one fatty acid. And these can then get across the membrane and reassemble again as a triglyceride within the cell. And then these reformed triglycerides then combine with carrier molecules, which allows them to be carried throughout the, the blood system, which is water soluble, to go to the various parts of the body to be used. So triglycerides is the form that's in our wild Alaskan salmon oil. And it contains triglycerides with varying amounts of EPA, DHA, as well as the other fatty acids such as omega-9, um, omega-7, which are also attached to glycerol. And then this form here, which is in our triple strength, is the ethyl ester form. And it's made when the natural triglyceride form is concentrated. And the DHA and EPA free fatty acids are esterified to form ethyl esters, which incorporates an ethyl backbone that you can see on the left. So during this process, the glycerol backbone of the triglyceride is removed and some of the shorter chain fatty acids are also taken out as well. 
And the advantage to, to this form is that it can provide double or even triple the amount of EPA and DHA that you would normally find in fish oil supplements. And so you can achieve a therapeutic dose with, with much fewer capsules. And as you can see, the, the ethyl ester form contains just one fatty acid. And there's one form of ethyl ester with an EPA fatty acid and another form with a DHA fatty acid. And so these are what make up Sargol's triple strength omega-3. Um, and also, as mentioned, we also have additional vitamin E to ensure the protection of, of these from oxidation. So this could be a good fish oil to recommend to clients not consuming any oily fish in the diet who, or who maybe have health reasons, uh, such as a risk of cardiovascular conditions. Um, and so high levels of EPA and DHA may be appropriate. Whereas the, the wild Alaskan may be more suited to those who've already got some omega-3s in the diet, but they want to supplement uh, to, to reflect the levels that are found in nature. And um, just a couple of studies that I'll just, just mention now as well, which I um, thought would be of interest for you. Um, you may well have seen uh, the programme that was on quite recently, um, a study conducted on the BBC programme Trust Me, I'm a Doctor with Michael Mosley. Um, the background to this study was based on the fact that most people or most people in the West don't consume enough omega-3 oils in the diet. So what's the best way to make sure that you're getting omega-3 to keep you in good health? oily fish or omega-3 supplements and what difference can it actually take, make to your health taking these. So 60 candidates were recruited to take part in a, a two-month trial and one of the key, the key tests that they were looking at was measuring the omega-3 index and this is a blood test that measures um, how much omega-3 fats are in your red blood cells and this is seen as a good guide for how much omega-3 is in your body overall. Um, and it's calculated as a percentage of the total fats that you have in your blood cells. So the volunteers were, were divided into three groups. Group one had oily fish. Group two uh, had an omega-3 supplement. And then group three was the control group. So they had neither. And so they were blindly consuming this, this, these amounts, um, having about 240 grams of fish um, or about 1,500 milligrams of omega-3 combination of EPA and DHA. And at the end, all the, the tests were run again to see if anything had changed. And the results for the participants' omega-3 index is shown on the graph here at the bottom. So an, an omega-3 index of 3% or below is, is, is thought to put you at a high-risk category for heart, attack, heart attacks and strokes. Um, index in the middle of 4 to 8% puts you at moderate risk. And an index of 8% or above means that you're low risk. So before the trial started, all the volunteers had a fairly low omega-3 index, um, around about 4 to 5%. Um, but some are as low as 3%. So, so at the beginning, many volunteers were at a moderate to high risk of serious illness. And then after the trial, the, the oily fish group and the omega-3 supplement group all went up to 7 to 8%, uh, meaning that they're heading towards a low-risk category. Um, and the, the, greatest, the greatest improvement was actually seen from those taking the, the fish oil supplements, as you can see with the, um, with, with the charts, with the bars there at the bottom. So rather interesting. And then looking at those who've been unfortunate enough to have a heart attack, research shows fish oil supplements can really help with that recovery uh, period. So according to a study that was published last year in the American Heart Association's journal Circulation, uh, patients who took a high dose of omega-3 fatty acids uh, for, from fish oil daily for six months after a heart attack, improved the heart's function and re actually reduced scarring in the undamaged muscle. So the heart shape and function can be altered after a heart attack, uh, a condition known as post-heart attack remodeling that can lead to poor outcomes and, and heart failure again. And therapy so far to heal the heart or to prevent this adverse remodeling have, have remained really scarce. So a previous study found that omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil were associated with improved survival for heart attack patients. But the role in improving the structure and tissue of the heart um, was really not very well known. So 
In this recent randomized clinical trial that you can see here, patients took a dose of four grams of omega-3 fatty acids for six months in comparison to those taken placebo. And the results suggest that omega-3 fatty acids allow the heart to contract better and, and actually reduces the fibrosis in the region that's not damaged. And the research has also observed a reduction in biomarkers for inflammation. So this suggests that the omega-3 fatty acids had uh, anti-inflammatory properties as well. And then this is just really just a very, very quick, I'll be very brief because I think most of you will really be very much aware of this already. This is just the, you know, the, the application of, of, um, of fish oils in, in, in health. Um, so we've just looked at heart health and how it can help with prevention of heart disease as well as support after a heart attack. Um, so clearly EPA supports cardiovascular and circulatory health and clinical trials show numerous effects on lipids blood pressure, vascular function, platelet function and inflammation. Um, and support also comes from both, you know, the omega-3, but also the omega-7 and omega-9 fatty acids with omega-7s having lipid lowering and systemic anti-inflammatory benefits as well. Um, other areas which are mentioned here on this slide are brain health. Uh, so um, conditions such as poor memory, depression, anxiety can, can all be, be helped. Um, and research, again, shows omega-3s may inhibit the ability of stress to cause inflammation. So could actually counteract the toxic effects of mental stress. Um, if we look at metabolism, the, you know, the, the athletic performance um, of athletes can be improved by increasing the VO2 max. Um, and it can also help with prevention of fatty liver and, and improve cholesterol metabolism as well as muscle fatigue. Uh, digestion, so inflammatory conditions such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's have been shown to be improved with, with omega-3. Uh, asthma, again, looking at inflammation um, is something that can be helped. When we move on to the musculoskeletal area, so again, reducing you know, inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, officials, interestingly, may also increase bone density. And this, this may be by increasing the amount of calcium that's uptake, up, uptaken by the bones. Uh, so potentially good for osteoporosis as well. Um, look at skin health. So again, reducing inflammation for for, for acne, um, omega-7 in the wild Alaskan salmon oil is an actual constituent of the skin sebum. Um, so it has a very nice soothing um, effect on the, on the skin. So good for, for eczema, for example. Um, and that, I think, is that from, from me? Oh, that was great. Thank you very much, um, Eve and Nicola. So I think we'll open it up now to some questions. So um, let me start off with um, the first question, and it's posed at both um, Eve and Nicola. Do you ever come across clients who are high in omega-3 and low in omega-6 on average? Do you, want, do you want to address that, Nicola? So clients who are high in omega-3 and and low in omega-6 um i would say that it, it could, could well be for for potentially women maybe in in particular um so if if someone's got say painful breasts or excessive premenstrual syndrome and, and all, the, all the conditions that go with that um it may well be that they've got low low gla in particular in, in relation to to omega-3 um Possibly in those maybe with, with dry skin and eczema, again, these are things which um, GLA can really be helpful for. So it may be that the, 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 there's an imbalance there. So it's, yeah, so it's always worth looking. It's, 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 you always have to look at, I think, at the two together, both the omega-3 and the omega-6. It's, it's, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend looking at just one or the other in, in isolation. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if I can pose this one at you as well, Nicola. When would, would it be appropriate to supplement with omega-6, such as evening primrose oil? Um, well, again, I think that would be for, I, I tend to think of um, sort of inflammatory kind of situations and hormonal. 
So, um, so I definitely the the premenstrual syndrome for for women, those who are going through menopause. Um, you know, it, it can either work or not work. Again, depending on your how you metabolize these uh, these these fatty acids, but it, it can be incredibly good for them. But it, it can take a number of months to to kick in. Um, so give it two to three months to to really to take an effect for for say evening primrose oil, for example, um, or borage oil. Um, and also, interestingly, even say for chronic fatigue, uh, sometimes that there's some research showing that there might be a deficiency of omega six, and again, EPO in particular, the the GLA, I should say, um, gamma-linolenic acid, um, that that could be potentially helpful for those suffering from chronic fatigue. Um, and again, those with dry skin, eczema, acne, psoriasis, again, just trying to reduce that inflammation. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, just a few questions on um, some of the products you've um, introduced this morning. Uh, the first one, are, are the Sohai salmon taken from the wild after, sp- after spawning? Um, I think it would be. I would have to get back to you to absolutely confirm that. Um, so I, I imagine so, but to be absolutely sure, I'd need to dig in a little bit deeper just to be a hundred percent for you guys, but I'm pretty sure. Yes. Okay, yes, thanks, yeah. Nick. sure it would be. And is there a vegetarian equivalent for the fish oils? We've got, um, we have a DHA supplement, which is suitable for, for vegans, but it doesn't have the EPA in it. Uh, so that's all that we have actually at the moment, because we do have, uh, other supplements, but they generally we we did have a uh, a flax oil, but it, it's it it wasn't so. I, I just think it wasn't quite as effective as as the fish oils. Um, so um, yeah, it's just we have a DHA on its own, which is suitable for for vegans, but not the EPA, I'm afraid. Okay, all right, thanks. Is the triple strength omega three source from the same salmon, the sockeye, as the full spectrum? No, the, the triple strength that's more um, that that's more global. So that's we, um, we we tend to follow maybe that. So, so we, one particular area is not over overfished. Um, we actually follow the the, the 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 shoals of fish as they they travel around. So that's more global, and it won't be it won't be the sockeye salmon. No, that would be like gaddis. So it's it's a collection of different fish, um, a range like mackerel. For example, just 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 different oily fish that that make up that collection. So not one particular um, species. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, back to the two case studies, and I might actually bring Eve in um, on this question as well. So let's deal with the, the first part of the question. Um, what SNP and questionnaire combination would call for supplementation with the triple strength omega, and for how long? An overall impaired result, so you would get that uh, within the report, you would get that indication of an impairment. Um, um, So look at their epigenetic side, check the questionnaire. Um, Combine with the genetic variations, probably in both the FADS 1 and 2. Um, And I was always taught no more than three months at a time supplementation. And then we look at the questionnaires. Obviously, the genetics will never change with the epigenetics. Uh, which is the part that we're interested in as nu- as nutritional therapists will change, um, and you can re- retest that. Maybe looking at um, a functional test as well, you could get the omega uh, three index done and keep a check on it that way. Um, I think that would be a good starting point. Thanks, Eve. Um, Another question for you. Um, if my client is heterozygous on both FADS1 and FADS2 and their questionnaire is in the healthy range, should I supplement them? And then if so, what supplement or dosage would you recommend? So I, again, you'd have to look at the epigenetics carefully. Uh, and this is where you would put all of the um, other aspects of nutritional therapy into play. So you could start to look at any uh, family history, maybe of cardiovascular disease, um, look at their antecedents and mediators, how worried are they? What are their stress levels like currently? So you could use the other questionnaires that are available on My DNA Health. 
Um, but it is epigenetically important to take care of these genotypes. Um, and if there is a concern there, you could put in an omega-3 um, supplementation or use diet, as I said before. Um, again, you could get an omega-3 index done and check that way. It's really information for the client, um, the, gen the genotype as such, um, and to be aware for the future. Um, and it can help very much so with compliance, and I've found that within my own practice. Um, clients are very aware of it once they've found out this information, but it's up to the practitioner to advise dietary, looking at the whole case um, from a holistic approach. Okay. Thanks, Eve. Um, so if um, we've had a question about the two case studies that you presented, um, so this is either a um, question for you or for Nicola. Um, so the Susan and the Rosie um, case studies, um, what supplement levels do you recommend for each case? Um, uh, Nicola, Well, again, it's just uh, it's just looking at the comparison of of the two. I think when when there is an issue with um, the when, when there is an issue with with omega three um, metabolism, then you you want to be uh, you really want to boost the levels. Then I would go for the for, for the triple strength, and that's that's the strongest that we have, and it's a very strong one that you I think you will find. You know, we, we look at a, a whole number of of fish oils. Um, the amounts that we have in there if I just go back and look so we've got um so 1,800 1,008 milligrams of EPA and 756 milligrams of DHA in a daily dose so that that would be the the higher the higher strength one that, that I would recommend for those who are really deficient with um with omega-3 whereas with the wild Alaskan um you know that that is that is lower again. So that for the EPA, that's two hundred and two milligrams and one hundred and eighty milligrams of DHA. So for those who have maybe just a, a normal, uh, you know, normal levels and just need more maintenance, then I would recommend that for for those particular clients. But if you might have more to say on that, um, oh, that's yes. Great. First um, case study, Rosie, possibly the lower strength would be a nice addition to her um, nutritional requirements overall. But with the second case, um, taking into account both what the epigenetics and the um, functional tests that we had, it probably would be rise to try her on a sort of three month start of the higher dose uh, omega 3s to really boost up that side and help her with her genetic variation there to support her um her function for that enzyme. Eve, um I guess it's for both of you as well. Um so with the with those two case studies, um would you do the DNA test first and then see um if you require an additional functional test or would you do the functional test first and then um check the variants? I think it depends again on your client. Um, so the um, genotype is useful for underlying information and again as I said the compliance very useful for that and if you um, suspected there is an issue but you weren't too sure and, and you were trying to figure out specifically with supplements so as Nicola said sometimes the if you were supplementing with the GLA it's not for everyone it may be an issue with your fad genotype there as well um, that's really interesting. Um, I would always like to combine the two, if possible, the functional as well. Um, the functional will just give you a snapshot of that particular moment when the person had their blood taken, um, whereas the genotype is unchangeable, and is uh, so you have to look at it from both both sides of the coin. Thank you, uh, Nicola. Do you have anything else to add to that? Um, I don't think I can actually. That's a really comprehensive answer. Okay, super. All right, I think with time now, we just start going off to 12. I um, just want to say a huge thank you to both Eve and for Nicola. Um, I certainly found it a very informative webinar. I think the content was uh, very high standard. We will be setting up the recording um, together with additional support notes. So that'll come out um, the next day or so. So look out for that.
if anyone is interested in doing an upgrade to the new, new EFA pathway, that's also available. So if you've already had the comprehensive panel test, um, it's a nice, easy upgrade, um, cost-effective upgrade as well for any of the clients. If you have anyone in particular that you want to actually just run the EFA panel, we, we can do that as well. So we'll send out all the information and the links to, to these um, upgrade panels or, or the individual panel as well. So just a huge thank you for everyone for taking out the time and um, for spending this um, hour with us. Um, we love these educational programs and we will certainly be doing more. Um, the next one we'll be looking at will be on inflammation and oxidative stress. And we've got some dates um, already um, available for that. So we'll be communicating that to you as well. So just to say thank you and have a really good rest of the sunny afternoon. Thank you and goodbye.